about how to find out what works in health, how to determine which treatments, actions, strategies, plans work and which don't work. And that's that is what causal inference is all about, really. So so how how do we estimate causal effects? Uh, well, there is a standard answer in science is if we want to estimate the causal effect, then uh, we run a randomized experiment or if it is with humans, we call it a randomized trial. So that's the standard way of finding out what works. So you can think that for any question that we may have about the comparative effectiveness or the comparative safety of two treatments, uh, there is a randomized trial that in principle would answer that question. But as you know well, we cannot do randomized trials all the time. Sometimes they are too expensive, sometimes they are not ethical, sometimes they are not practical, sometimes they are going to be conducted eventually, but we don't have them yet and we have to make decisions now. And then sometimes we won't maybe use as simple as not finding someone who will uh, who will fund and conduct the trials. The problem is that even if we don't have randomized trials, we still need to make decisions. And that's why we need to look at another source of human data, which is observational data, data that that is not coming from from trials. And when I talk about observational data, I talk about many different types of of data. There are some uh, observational data sets that are generated specifically for research, like these large cohorts, like the farming cohort study or the nursing uh, health study. And then there are other sources of data that are not generated specifically for research. Think of electronic medical records or insurance claims. All these large healthcare databases with millions of people and thousands of variables there were not generated for research. They were generated for clinical management or for administrative purposes and any other thing, but we repurpose them for research. And that is what is now known as real world data. It's, that is one of the of the new terms that are very fashionable these days. So we are going to be using that because we don't have a randomized trial. And that's that's an important point that I want to emphasize. It's not that we love observational data. It's that it's our only chance to answer some questions because we don't have a randomized trial for those questions. But as I said, for each question, for each causal question that, that we have, we can think of a hypothetical randomized, randomized trial that if that trial were conducted, then it would answer our question. That trial is the target of our causal inference. So we refer to that hypothetical trial as the target trial. OK, the target trial is the hypothetical randomized trial that would answer our causal question if we could do it. So we can think of causal analysis of observational data as an attempt to emulate the corresponding target trial. That's one way of thinking about what causal inference is. Causal inference from observational data is our attempt to emulate a hypothetical target trial that we don't have but we would like to have. We can go farther. We can go farther. We can say that, in fact, if we think we have a causal question, but we cannot translate that causal question into a hypothetical target trial, then we probably don't have a very clear causal question. So it goes both, both, both ways. And this concept of a target trial uh, has been in the literature for a very long time. The earliest reference I found was uh, it's from the 1950s by Dorn, uh, a statistician at the National Institute of Health in the US. Also at the, around the same time, Gold, an econometrician working in Sweden, was talking about this, about this idea of using observational data to mimic a randomized experiment as closely as possible. These people were not using the label target trial, but they were using the same concept. And other people in the last uh, few decades have, have also been talking about, about this. Uh, Cochrane, Rubin at Harvard, Feinstein 
IEL, David in Cambridge. So all these people were talking about this idea of using observational data to mimic a randomized experiment, but they were talking about this idea mostly in simple settings in which the treatment of interest happens at one time only. So these are questions of the type of should we treat or not now, period. But most questions that we have in health, in medicine and in public health are not like that. Most questions are about strategies, about treatment strategies that are sustained over time. Should I treat now and keep treating for the next five years unless the treatment doesn't work and then I switch to a different treatment? For that type of questions, we need to expand the theory uh, so that we can think of the appropriate target trial. And that is what Jamie Robbins did in the mid 80s. So what I'm going to describe now is based on on the way that um, Robbins started to think about these complex uh, questions with time varying treatments and time varying compounders, even though uh, because in the interest of time, I will be focusing on, on non time varying treatments. So the this concept of a target trial once we start thinking about causal inference in terms of emulating a target trial, then we can see that there are really only two steps in this causal inference business. The first one is we have to ask the causal question, and the second one is that we have to answer the causal question. And this is probably the most important slide today, is keeping in mind that causal inference is about asking questions and answering questions, but we cannot answer a question we haven't asked first. That seems obvious, but a lot of the problems that we see in observational analysis are a result of not thinking of this as two different steps. Now, how, how, how do we ask a causal question? Well, we design a randomized trial, the target trial. So the first step in causal inference from observational data is to design a randomized trial that we may never do. We have to write, we have to be able to write the protocol of the randomized trial. And then, um, then we, if we can, then we can conduct that target trial. If we can't, then we have to use observational data to explicitly emulate each of the components of a protocol of a target trial. And explicitly is the keyword here. So what are the protocols of a component of a target trial? Well, same as any other randomized trial. We have to, we have to define the eligibility criteria, the treatment strategies, how treatment is going to be assigned, the start and end of follow-up, the outcomes of interest, the, the causal contrast, is it going to be an intention to treat effect or a pair protocol effect, and of course the, the data analysis. And then once we have specified these things for the target trial. Now we can use the observational data to emulate each of the components explicitly. And the reason is that when we don't do that, we are more likely to uh, make mistakes. We are more likely to end up with a study that is biased, that give us associations that cannot be interpreted as causal effects. And in fact, many of the big failures of causal analysis from observational data are because of this, as because there was not an explicit attempt to emulate a target trial. People think that observational studies are wrong because they are not randomized, because there is no randomization. Well, that's one possible problem, but a lot of the big problems have nothing to do with that and and I mean one one example of this that we'll have time to go in detail now is the example of hormone therapy and um, and coronary heart disease in post menopausal women. This is an example uh, that we have described in detail in the literature in which uh, the observational data was perfectly good, and in fact you can use the data to replicate what the trials found, but because it wasn't used in the right way, that was a problem. Rather than going over that example, I'm going to go to the over a more recent example uh, that is based on work that Barbara Dickerman led. And this is an example in which um, it that is very interesting because it's clearly cannot be due to, to compounding, to lack of randomization. 
let me go. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background here. Th there are many observational studies. There are several observational studies published in very prominent medical journals that have found that people who use statins have a lower risk of cancer. Okay, much lower risk of cancer, 50, 60 percent lower risk of cancer. Now we know that that result is incorrect. We know that it's not causal. Why? Well, one, because there are meta analyses of randomized trials uh, that have shown that really there is no effect of statins on cancer. And two, because it, an effect as strong as that should have been even noticeable at, at the population level. But the reason why there is an error in these studies cannot be lack of randomization because lack of ran, because the randomized assignment of treatment um, is good to protect us against compounding against uh, the fact that people who get the treatment and people who don't get the treatment may have a different risk profile for the outcome. But people who get statins and people who don't get statins, uh, wh why should they have a different risk of cancer, right? Uh, it's not that doctors give statins to people with a higher risk of cancer. They give statins to people with a higher risk of heart disease. So if we were looking at the effect of statins on heart disease and we'll have a randomized assignment, we should be very worried because there may be lots of confounding. But for cancer, why, why should, should there be a lot of confounding there? So what we did was to use observational data to emulate a target trial of statins and cancer. The first thing that we did was to, to design the target trial, and this is the protocol of this is an outline of a protocol of a randomized trial of statins and cancer. I'm not going to go into detail here, but I want to make a couple of comments. One is that in this hypothetical randomized trials of statins and cancer, um, we cannot have placebo as a comparator because we are using observational data. We are using real world data, and in the real world, that is not placebo. We also cannot have a blind assignment of the treatment because in the real world, everyone knows which treatment they are getting. So when we're talking about the target trial, it's important to keep in mind that the target trial is a pragmatic trial. So the, the best that we can do with observational data is to em emulate a pragmatic randomized trial in which the comparator group is standard of treatment, in which there is no blind assignment, uh, there is no an intensive monitoring, there is no attempt to enforce adherence. So that is what we can do with observational data, and it's, and it's important uh, to keep this in mind to set expectations at the right time. Also, the target trial is not the ideal trial that we would like to conduct. The target trial is a trial that we can uh, we can emulate with the data that we have. And that may not be exactly the trial that we would like to do, but if it is close enough, it may make sense to do the analysis. If it is too far, then uh, we probably have to stop and look for a different data set to do the to do this work, right? But this um, this specification and emulation of a target trial is typically an iterative process. We propose a target trial, we look at the data, see what is possible, what is not possible. We, we may have a target trial with three arms, three different treatments. Then we look at the data and one of the treatments is not used. Okay, then we have to go back and change our target trial and have only two arms. If that is still of interest, we do it. If, if it is not, because we really needed to have three arms, then we have to look for a different database to do this. Okay, in this in this case, we we were um, using electronic medical records from the UK from the Caliber resource to um, emulate the target trial of statins and cancer. It is about seven percent of the population in the UK. Lots of data, the typical data that you expect to find in medical records. And then we just went and using the 
observational data, we emulated each of the components of the target trial. So the first component, the eligibility criteria. We had to find people in the data who meet the eligibility criteria of the target trial. Then we had to find people who um, who start statins because that is the strategy uh, that we are going to compare with people that are not starting and we classify uh, people uh, either uh, people who start statins or do not start statins while meeting the eligibility criteria and then we follow them and look at the outcome. Okay, in this process, of course, there is no randomization because this is real world data where this treatment has not been assigned at random. How do we try to emulate randomization? Well, by adjusting for compounding. When people say I am adjusting for compounding, what they mean is I'm trying to emulate a randomized assignment. If I could adjust for all the compounders, there will be no difference between a, between a randomized trial and an observational study. Of course, we don't know if we can adjust for all the compounders, and that's why observational data for causal inference is a dangerous, uh, is, is um, causal inference from observational data is risky because we don't know if we are adjusting for the confounders or, or not. And there are many there are many methods to adjust for confounding. The method is typically not the most important thing when we have a non invariant treatment like here. The method that we use to adjust for confounding is is typically more a matter of taste of personal taste. Uh, we can we can use any method if we have enough data we will be able to adjust correctly for confounders as, as long as we have the confounders in the data. That is the most important part. OK, then um, we can we can use the observational data to emulate either an analog of intention to treat effect in a randomized trial by comparing people. When I say people who start studying some people who don't start well it's really people who are prescribed studies and people who are not and that's the analog of the intention to treat analysis in a in a um, randomized trial or we can try to estimate the the analog of the pep protocol effect in a trial which is the effect if people had uh, taken the treatment over time so they initiate statins and they keep taking them as long as there is no contraindication for that. So if we emulate now the analysis of the trial, we can do something like an intention to treat analysis in which we compare these groups, those who are prescribed statins, those who are not prescribed statins, and then um, and then we adjust for confounders. In this case, we were adjusting for uh, for these potential confounders. If some important confounder is, is missing here, then our estimates would be biased. OK, so I hope that this process doesn't look very, uh, very difficult. It seems like a natural way of using the observational data to compare uh, a study in initiation versus no initiation for the risk of cancer. And after doing all these analysis, these are the uh, hazard ratios that we found, which are essentially very close to one. Uh, we found not much evidence that studies are associated with a lower risk of cancer for total cancer and for different types of cancer. And then if we look at this on the absolute scale, again, uh, almost complete overlap of the survival of the cancer survival uh, the survival curves for the for the study and the you know, starting group. Now this is interesting because this is very different from what has been found in all these observational studies that I mentioned. And what we have done in all the papers has been to do kind of a post mortem of previous observational studies to see what happened there. There is, a, there is a paper by Barbara Dickerman in the International Journal of Epidemiology that goes in detail over what happened in, in one of these studies uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and we uh, pinpoint what happened. And what happened really is that it deviated 
from a target trial. The design of the study is not what you would have done in a randomized trial. This is a, a different paper that also found a very strong association, in, inverse association between statins and cancer risk. In this paper, the odds ratio was 0 0.2, 0 0.23 for lung cancer. So think about what what this means. There is there is a publication out there that says that people who use statins for 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 more than four years have a uh, what, what is that? It's 77% it's lower risk of cancer compared with people who don't use statins. That's okay, wow, 77% lower risk of cancer by using statins and not of lung cancer. How is that even possible? Well, we, we look into the analysis of that paper and we found two major deviations from uh, from the emulation of a target trial. The first one is that the comparison was not about people who are, that are assigned to statins and start statins versus those who don't start, but rather people in the statins group were people that had been using statins for some time. They were prevalent users, current users. Something that we will never do in a randomized trial, of course, because in a trial we start the follow up at the time that the treatment starts, at the time that the intervention starts, at the time that the decision is made, not uh, two years later. Right? So that is a possible source of selection bias. And then the other problem is that the way in that people were were assigned to one group or the other was based on on the on what they were doing in the future. So at baseline, people were put in the group more than four years of statins based on whether in the future they were taking statins for more than four years. Again, something we would never do in an experiment. In an experiment in a trial, we would uh, assign people to different groups based on what they do at, at that time, at baseline. Not, we don't change them from group after seeing what they do over the next four years. That is a recipe for immortal time bias. And in fact, if we do that thing with our own data, yes, we also found uh, hazard ratios from 0.2 or 0.3, but they are uh, completely biased. Because as we have seen, when we do a normal thing, a natural thing, which is the emulation of a target trial, the hazard ratios are one. So think about this. What was the problem in this observational analysis? The problem, was it lack of randomization? The answer is no. The problem was not lack of randomization. We can show with the same observational data that if we emulate a target trial, we get the same result as the actual, actually randomized trials, which is no association between no randomization. Well, of course there is a problem. If there is no randomization, it's something that may introduce bias. But in example after example, what we encounter is a situation in which the bias of observational analysis had nothing to do with the lack of randomization. It was a bias that happened because of deviations from, uh, from sound study design, from sound principles of study design, meaning from deviations of a emulation of a target trial. And these problems have to do, if you think about this, about these uh, two problems that I mentioned, the selection bias and the immortal time bias, these problems have to do not with the lack of randomization, but with how the start of follow-up is handled, time zero of follow-up, how it is handled. And in fact, I'm going to argue that if we want to improve causal inference from observational studies, uh, the first thing that we have to focus on is in handling time zero correctly. That's really where we can make a huge difference in the quality of observational studies. So let me let me let me talk a little bit about time zero, because time zero, in a truly randomized trial, uh, is very well defined. It's the time of randomization. We have a randomized experiment. At the time of randomization, we start following people. And we don't even think about it. It's so 
obvious that is so trivial that we don't we don't give it much thought. But let's think about what happens at, at time zero then. At time zero in a randomized trial is when a person meets the eligibility criteria and it's assigned to a treatment. Those two things happen at time zero. Well, the same thing should happen in an observational analysis that emulates a target trial. What is true for a randomized trial is true also from observational analysis. And the problems that we see in observational analysis for causal inference is that these two things, the eligibility and the assignment to treatment are not aligned for some people. Think about what I was um, describing before. Uh, here, this, this graph shows four examples in which the assignment A and the eligibility E are not aligned at time zero. The second one, for example, is when we uh, find people who meet the el eligibility criteria at time zero, at T zero, but they were assigned to treatment before time zero. So we are using current users, so permanent users, people who have been using treatment for some time. And that uh, may introduce selection bias because the people that make it to eligibility criteria may be different from people who didn't make it precisely because they were on treatment. The fourth one is the immortal time bias example that I gave you in which at, at, at time zero, at baseline, some people meet the eligibility criteria, but then we assign them to one group or the other based on what they do in the, in the future. So E and A are not aligned, are not happening at the same time as they happen in every single randomized trial. So this problem of observational studies is not uh, given sometimes a lot of attention, how we handle, how, how we specify time zero is, has, um, has the potential to create so much bias that it doesn't matter whether there is randomization or not. If you do the same thing in, in to a randomized trial, to data from a randomized trial, you will get the same bias. So before really, before we worry about lack of randomization, we need to make sure that time zero is assigned correctly, that we are handling eligibility and assignment in the right way. Then we can worry about lack of randomization, but many times we're doing it backwards. We're saying, oh, this, this observational analysis is biased. It must be because of lack of randomization, when actually, uh, all the evidence is that that is not the main culprit in many, many cases. Now, why why is this happening? Because you could say, well, but yeah, this this how 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 I hope that when we are talking about this now that you find it as obvious. But if you read papers in the literature, is that there are many many papers where this basic principle is not followed and eligibility and assignment are not synchronized. So why? Well, this has to do a lot with something that epidemiologists started to do in the 1950s, 1960s. They started to think of data analysis as something that has to do with person time. Something has to do in which, um, I don't know if you have learned this before, I did, and I taught it for some time too, is that you take your data, and you divide it into years. So now you have person years. A person that is followed for 10 years will contribute 10 person years. Now each person year is assigned to either exposed or unexposed. So now we have exposed person time, unexposed person time, and then we compare that and say, this is the incidence rate for exposed person time versus unexposed person time. And why, and why is that a problem? Well, because then we lose track of time zero because time zero is, is a concept that applies to a person, not to a person year or a person time. So when an analysis is organized around this concept of person time, which is how a lot of epidemiologic analysis have been organized for the last half a century or more, then we have a problem because then we cannot guarantee that eligibility and um, eligibility and and assignment happen 
at, at the same time. Those two things are lost because now we are thinking about years, not about persons. And the way to solve this is to do an explicit target trial emulation. Now, not everybody agrees, and some people have criticized this way of thinking about causal inference from observational data. And th th these are some of the criticisms that I've heard, and uh, you have any others, I'd be very happy to talk after doing the questions and answers part of this talk. So let's, let's talk about the first one. Some people say, well, yes, I mean, you are showing that target trial emulation works, but you are showing it as in examples for which we know the answer. You knew the answer, right? So all these examples that I gave you now, the hormone therapy and coronary heart disease, the observational studies were conducting, the, there was a randomized trial that showed that they were wrong, and then we go back and check why they were wrong, and we find it, but we knew the right answer from the trial, and the same for the statins and cancer. So um, this, these are helpful teaching examples because we know the right answer. Now we can we can show how explicit target trial emulation would have avoided the bias. But um, and that's why we get this answer. Yes, but but you knew the answer, uh, which is a little bit. I mean, this this comment is it hurts a little bit because it sounds as if because we knew the answer, we did something um, uh, with the data that we shouldn't have done. Uh, but even unconsciously, we might have done it. So, so let me let me show you examples of observational emulations of the target trial in which the emulation was done first and then a randomized trial was conducted and confirm what the observational studies found. Um, one of these examples was uh, um, uh, more than 10 years ago when there was a lot of debate about when antiretroviral therapy should be started in persons with HIV. And there were observational studies here. I'm showing you a couple led by um, Lauren Kane and and Sarah Lodi that found that you should start therapy as, as soon as possible. That is exactly what a randomized trial uh, found years years later. The clinical guidelines were were changed based on observational studies, and that was the right thing to do. If we go, if we come a little bit uh, closer in time to the COVID period in in 2020. There were observational studies that, sh that showed that docilizumab lower mortality uh, in critical patients with COVID-19, and that was confirmed by a randomized trial later. There was also observational studies that found that the use of anticoagulants did not reduce mortality in COVID-19 patients, which was also confirmed by a randomized trial later. Um, studies observational studies shown that plasma therapy did not affect mortality. Also, it was confirmed by a randomized trial. Um, vaccine boosters. You know, when in the when in the late summer, early fall of um, the year 21, if a vaccine booster is recommended for the entire population, that's based on, on observational studies. Only this, uh, this is this was one of them out of Israel, uh, but there were several others, and those observational studies with no randomized trial were used to make a very uh, a very uh, critical decision for vaccination programs around the world. A randomized trial was conducted, and three months later gave the uh, show that uh, the observational is, is the observational studies had been correct the problem is that when the trial finished and we had the results the delta variant had dis disappeared so the results from the trial were not useful to for decision making this is an example in which we had to use 
observational data to have a timely uh, hope to have timely timely information to um, to guide decision making. Another example is screening colonoscopy and colorectal cancer incidence. This is a, a study that was led by Xavier Garcia de Albenit, and it found that there was a moderate effect of screening colonoscopy on the incidence of colorectal cancer, a moderate benefit, and this is exactly what a randomized trial confirmed three months ago. So this is not really a criticism of target trial emulation. If I if I show you here some examples in which we knew the answer is because it's easier, uh, those are examples that make it the teaching of the concept easier. But there are many, many observational studies that were done before the randomized trial was done and uh, and they got the right answer. In fact, contrary to what many people think, it's very hard to find observational studies with sound design that are contradicted by trials later. There are not many examples of that. Um, okay, the second criticism that we hear sometimes is that, well, target trial emulation doesn't solve all, all the problems of causal inference from observational data. And the answer is, yeah, of course not. So what we do with explicit target trial emulation is we eliminate the biases that are due to the design, to bad design. The selection biases and the immoral data and biases, we don't eliminate biases due to compounding, biases due to lack of randomization. So that, the bias that happens because it's an observational study and it's not randomized, that confounding bias has to be solved by adjusting for compounders. And no, and no method of cause and inference from observational data uh, is going to change that. So we need to have information on compounders. And that's, um, that, is, that is really the goal of explicit target trial emulation, eliminate all those biases that are not in the data, like compounding is, but biases that we create if we don't do do those things uh, right. In fact, just let me give you an example of, of where uh, um, target trial emulation doesn't work. So if, if we go back to the study of, a, of screening colonoscopy, and now rather than using as the outcome incidence of colorectal cancer, we use total mortality. In this study, we find a completely biased effect estimate in which it looks like screening colonoscopy lowers the risk of mortality by six percentage points or something, which is just not possible. It's not possible because even if a screening colonoscopy could prevent all colorectal cancers, colorectal cancer is what, like, 0.5% of the, of the people die from colorectal cancer. So we could never get an effect uh, that is 12 times bigger than that or so. So there are some cases in which we are not going to be able to use certain databases for causal inference from observational data. For example, if we try to estimate the effect of preventive services on total mortality using insurance claims like in this example, well, there is not enough clinical information and lifestyle information and all these other things in insurance claims to adjust for confounding. So we are going to fail. And that's the problem, of course, that we don't know, we cannot know for sure when our, our adjustment for confounding has been successful because it's an observational study. So we don't have um, we don't know if we have all the compounders or, or not. The, the way that we can deal with that is, well, using negative outcome controls or positive outcome controls, like in the uh, in the example of screening colonoscopy and, and death, we know that, well, the effect of a screening colonoscopy on total mortality should be very small. If we find a very big effect, we know that that is 
that, that is compounded. We can do quantitative bias analysis when we know the compounders that we are missing and we can simulate them to see how much that would change our estimates. Uh, we can we can do try angulation with data from other sources with other um, evidence that we may have, but this is going to be always the problem of causal inference from obs observational data because there is no because treatment is not randomly assigned. We may have bias. The whole point of target trial emulation is getting rid of all the other biases so that we can focus on compounding. So yeah, so when people say that target trial emulation doesn't solve all problems for the only possible answer is that, yeah, of course not. It solves some, some problems, not others. Okay, uh, the third thing that some people say is that all this target trial emulation thing is just marketing, right? It's marketing because really all we are saying is that we have to do good design. And rather than calling it good design, we are calling it target trial emulation. So when, when I hear this, when people say this, that this is for marketing, I just always have the same answer, which is define marketing. And um, you actually, I went to the dictionary and, and checked, and the definition of marketing is the process or technique of promoting, selling, and distributing a product or service. So yes, then target trial emulation is definitely marketing because it's a technique to promote good methodology for causal inference from observational databases. And maybe there are other ways to do it, but historically they have not worked because the literature is full of examples of observational analysis that don't meet sound principles of design despite a lot of us were saying, hey, please follow sound principles of design. It doesn't happen. So by, by, by using the target trial as a framework, we are not just saying do it right, we are giving people some guidelines to do it right. And I think this is going to help. So um, we can think of, of explicit target trial Emulation as a set of guidelines for improved causal research that may not be strictly necessary, but are very helpful for many people. And this is what I said a couple of years ago. I say that, of course, all these biases can be avoided by studious applications of principles of causal inference and study design, but the target, target trial approach helps in, interpret, in implementing this principle. So you can think of target trial emulation as a checklist, really. A checklist for safer causal research. So same as the pilots of airplanes have a checklist before they take off, or sergeants have a checklist before they operate, it's kind of the same thing. Um, is it needed? Well, I'm sure many pilots don't need it. They're so good, they can do it without a checklist or many sergeants don't need it, but, but we're glad that they, that they have a checklist because it has been proven uh, many times that the use of checklists uh, lowers the risk. So we have a checklist, which is this. We say just go um, uh, component of the protocol by component of the protocol and make sure that you can em emulate that in the correct way. So yeah, um, um, when people say that this is just marketing and branding, it's like, sure, whatever works. It, this makes it easier for people to apply sound uh, principles of a study design. That's all that, that we are looking for, really. So um, we go back to the start. Why is causal inference from observational data necessary? And we say, well, because Randomized trials cannot answer all questions. For example, we, we are not going to be able to use trials to, to, uh, to estimate precisely the effects in subgroups defined by, by, by age, sex, or hypertension, or any other, other things. We're not going to be use many, we're not going to be able to use many trials to estimate the long-term effects or the effects on rare outcomes because the sample size is not large enough. So one of the 
of the goals of causal inference from observational data is to extend the results from the trials. If we have trials, but that doesn't mean that we don't need trials, because if we have randomized trials, then we, the first thing that we can do is to replicate the results from the trials, the known results from the trials with the observational data. We call that benchmarking. Once we have shown that we can reproduce what the trials found, now we can extend it. And that will give us confidence that if we were able to replicate what we know is the truth, when we extend, we are not going, um, we are, we are going to, there is a greater chance that we are that we are doing it right. And an example of this is what happened with the with the COVID-19 vaccines. If you look at the randomized trials that were conducted in the year 2020, the trials that led to the approval of the vaccines or first approval for use, those trials were not very big. The this is the uh, this is the figure from the for the Pfizer bio and tech trial. He had only about 18,000 people, which is very it's a very low number for um, for a vaccine trial because we can show with this trial that there is an effect on symptomatic infection, but the if the our estimate of the effect for hospitalization is very imprecise. The estimate of the effect for death is even more imprecise. We cannot look at uh, different subgroups. We cannot look at uh, um, uh, at safety signals because with 18,000 people, we're not going to be able to find a lot of the possible side effects of the vaccine. And also, also this this was done. This trial was done at, at the time with the with the with the, with SARS-CoV-2 was the Wuhan uh, virus. It once even if we know that it works for that virus, we don't know if it's going to work for alpha or for delta or for omicron. So that is where observational studies come into the picture here too, right? So we can we can do um. We can do benchmarking of the results of a trial and then extend the results from the trial to to estimate effects on host on hospitalization on death on different subgroups safety etc we can also do that um uh, for cancer treatments right there are examples in which we there are trials for cancer treatment, and we know that one treatment is better than the other, but what about the effect in people over age 65? Well, there are not enough people in the trial to give that, so we can do benchmarking with the observational data and then extend the results to other people. Or um, this is an example of direct and acting and Antivirals and, hep and hepatitis C infection, same thing. There are trials, but we don't know if the effects are the same by groups of age, sex, etc. So we can do, we can use observational data to benchmark and then extend the results from the trial. The same thing has been done in studies of infertility therapies, in which uh, there is the there's some concern about possible side effects of this. Okay, fine. So we can we can first, but but the trials are not large enough to look at things like uh, complications in the mother or or in the newborn. So we can use op we can use observational data for that or for looking at at possible birth defects. That's something that we can do in the trial. We can do it in the observational data after benchmarking with the with the trial, right? So, so that's a very important role of causal inference from observational data. It's extending results from existing trials. Another role that is very important is that some trials won't be conducted, and we are on, we are going to have to use observational data, and we would like that these trials. Uh, for this trials to be conducted, but it's not going to happen. And this is what happens a lot of time with head-to-head -head trials, trials in which you compare one treatment versus the other. These trials are not done many times because there are no there are no incentives 
for pharmaceutical companies to do these trials. They get their drug approved when they compare, they compare it versus placebo. And why are they going to pay for a trial that compares that drug with a competitor's drug? And what if that drug is not as good? So there are a lot of cases in which we don't have head-to-head -head comparisons. And one example here uh, is, um, for example, for, for COVID vaccines, right? Of billions of dollars paid by governments around the world. And uh, there is no randomized trial that compares the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. All the information that we have about comparative effectiveness and comparative safety comes from observational studies. So that's a very important gap that we can fill with observational studies. So unless we completely change the system so that the gatekeepers of randomized trials do the trials that society needs or uh, we are going to be or we have to use observational data. Another example of, of this uh, uh, is uh, some cancer treatments. There are trials that show that one cancer treatment works and the other works, but we don't know which one is best. So again, we can use uh, observational data from, from an emulation of a of of a of the head-to-head -head trial that that we don't don't have. So the point here is that randomized trials and observational studies are not competitors. They are complementary approaches. And what we want is to use both at the same time in the best possible way. For example, we can use observational estimates to make decisions while trials are being finished in some cases, like in the antiretroviral therapy example that I showed you before. Or sometimes we can use the trials to do better observational analysis because we can do this benchmarking and then extend. Uh, and that is that is that is how that is how this uh, should work in many cases, right? First, we have a randomized trial that answers a limited question, and then we have an observational study that benchmarks that the estimates on the trial and extends to uh, broader questions or questions in different subgroups, longer follow-up, slightly different outcomes. Etc. So that is that is that is really um, one of the of the key messages here is that all this conversation about randomized trials versus observational studies gets a little bit boring because it's really not a race. It's really, of course, if in a perfect world we will have randomized trials for all the questions. That is my preference too, but it's not happening. And we still have many questions that need to be answered. So the best that we can do is apply sound principles of a study design and analysis, emulating a target trial when using observational data. So um, we need evidence for evidence-based decision making. Let's use both uh, evidence from randomized trials and from observational studies and combine them in the, in the best possible way. And this is the this is the proposed algorithm for causal inferences. First, we ask the question uh, by designing a trial. Then we answer the question by either conducting that trial or using observational data to do it. And the reason that this is very important is because if we don't ask the causal question first, we don't know what is our target. It's impossible to come up with an answer. I, I, a few years ago, I wrote this commentary about how many analyses, uh, many papers in the medical literature, they don't, they never mention the word causal. It's like uh, the C word that you don't say. They, it's all about associations, associations, associations. But by having this, this, uh, this language about associations, it's not precise 
enough. And this is one of the contributors to the problems that we have encountered in the in in observational studies. This is not about associations. Our goal is causal. Therefore, we have to precisely specify our causal question in the form of a target trial and then emulate it with the observational data. Only if we put it in these terms, we can uh, design an analysis, an observational analysis that is compatible with the question that we are trying to answer. So I want to finish here, but every time that someone presents effect estimates from an observational study, ask them what is the target trial? Because if they know what's their target trial, then you are going to engage in a very uh, fruitful scientific exchange. And if they don't know what's the target trial, you are going to help them a lot. So I'm going to finish here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not an expert in the causality, but uh, to me there is uh, so much similarity with Bayesian reasoning. So when uh, when you say that, uh, um, that, how do we know whether the confounding adjustments uh, are, are successful? We never know. So do we have to defend the causal adjustment that we do? Like uh, in Bayesian uh, in Bayesian reasoning, we have to Bayesian methods. We have to defend our priors. Uh, that is the point. That is the discussion with the community. So, uh, because of course there could be uh, many other reasons that, uh, with the knowledge of today, we don't have that confounds us. Uh, but is this the scientific debate with the community that has the value and that decides that this is an appropriate randomized trial or an appropriate prior? In my more common view, well, I would like to have your comment. Right. I mean, it's, of course, we, we are never going to be able to prove that there is no confounding, but we can do a lot, um, a lot of, we can make a lot of progress, for example, by by being experts in the in the research topic that we are studying. If we are talking about vaccination for COVID, then we need to know, we, we need to be experts or work with experts and know why some people get vaccinated and other people don't get vaccinated. And those are, and those um, those reasons, those factors that affect vaccination are the things that, that we are going to be looking at when we are thinking of variables to adjust for compounding. If we are estimate, if we are trying to estimate the effect of cancer treatments, we need to be experts or work with experts that tell us why some people are getting cancer treatment A, other people are getting cancer treatment B. What are the different, uh, what are the patient characteristics that affect that type of decision? Because the compounders are going to be there too. So by using expert knowledge, we can improve a lot our chances of not having a, a lot of uh, confounding, a lot of residual confounding. Also by using expert knowledge, we, we are going to to be, be in a better position to find variables that we should not adjust for, because there are some variables, colliders, variables that um, are common effects of the treatment and the outcome rather than common causes, that if we adjust for them, they're going to introduce bias. So the use of expert knowledge is a very important component of this. We, if we don't have, we cannot just uh, take a data set and say, OK, tell me which variable should I adjust for? I have variable X1, X2, X3, X4 and X5. Which of those should I adjust for? The answer from a scientist is, well, you have to tell me what is X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. And based on, on that, I can tell you what is my causal graph and which variables may or may not have to be adjusted. for. So that is, that is a very important part of it. In the future, it's possible that uh, we can ask uh, a large language model or something to tell us, okay, tell me what are the variables that are, and sure, and I'm sure that that, that will help in the future too. But that that is the first thing. Then we have other strategies that I mentioned very briefly here, like using negative outcome controls, like using qualitative bias, etc., that can help us understand whether we are very far from, um, whether we have lots of confounding left or not. But 
the bottom line is we are never going to know for sure. That's the that's the main limitation of causal inference from observation data. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Hernan. Uh, I can say really I congratulate you for this presentation and for the topic. This is something excellent that we are all looking for. Uh, by the way, I'm Abdurrahim Hajj. I'm from uh, uh, the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at the College of uh, Medicine. Uh, I think this is a very, very interesting topic. Uh, I'm very excited to read more about it because, as you said, uh, so far people are talking more about associations rather than causal uh, relationship. Uh, causal relationship is very, very difficult to get from observational studies. Uh, what I want to ask you is uh, there were some attempts before trying to solve this issue in some way by using what we call uh, rolling matching. So in rolling matching, what they used to do is they used to try to solve the problem of time T0 and eligibility. So they, they match according to standard or other methods. They match according to the risk factors, but as well according to uh, uh, when the patients uh, started the, for example, for aspirin, they will match someone. Uh, he took aspirin, for example, at a certain date. They will have to match someone else who is not exposed to aspirin uh, at the same date so that they will have exactly the same exposure. So these will remove in some way this, this problem of choosing uh, time T0 and eligibility. Um, did you have the chance in some way to compare for the same data set that you uh, try to analyze to apply the same method and to see if the results have been changed or not. So this is my first question. I have a lot of questions, but just two of that I'm going to ask you now. Uh, the second one, uh, do you guarantee from these methods, I'm going to read about it, of course, I'm very interested to that, that all uh, measured and unmeasured confounders are taken into account or just measured one? Thank uh, you. So let me start from the second question is we, we as as I said, we cannot guarantee that we have adjusted for all confounders. There may be some unmeasured confounders. That is the key of, I mean, that's that's the main shortcoming of course, our inference from observation data. Some bounds there, we can use our expert knowledge. Everything that I said before applies to the answer to this question. As for the first question, uh, the, the method that you describe is an emulation of target trials in a sequential manner. So rather when, when we have a treatment that may change over time, like vaccinations or statins, we need to uh, determine time zero in the correct way. There are several ways of doing that, but a very simple one is to is to uh, take, take um, is to emulate a new target trial, say every day of the year. For example, in the vaccination studies that I described here, we started on January 1st and we compare people who were vaccinated and not vaccinated in January 1st, then January 2nd, then January 3rd, then January 4th. So we end up emulating a sequence of target trials of 100 target trials. If there there they say a follow up of a hundred days and that's a way of making sure that eligibility and assignment are perfectly synchronized because each day we check for eligibility and each day we classify people to vaccinated and non-vaccinated or initiating statins or not initiating statins. So that is that is a simple way of dealing with this problem that in many cases works. So I have two questions that came over on the on, from the online audience. One of the major concerns of non-epidemiology folks is that administrative databases present with bias due to misclassification of either the exposure or the outcome. ICD codes are not 100% reliable. How do you tackle this in the methodology or design of the analysis? And how do you address this in the limitations section? Well, I will say that this is a concern that everybody has, epidemiologists and non-epidemiologists alike, because 
of course, is a is a serious concern. In this in this presentation, I was specifically not talking about measurement error and misclassification, but that is the other problem that we have in observational data um, that that we may have also in 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 many trials that use an ascertainment of the outcome through medical records, say or things like that, but it is even more prominent in analysis of observational da databases. The, the only possible answer here is if we are estimating the effect of a treatment A on an outcome Y, and we have evidence or belief that the treatment A is badly misclassified or the outcome Y is badly misclassified, then we shouldn't do it. We should look for a different data source with better uh, data quality because of course we will get bias and if we do it you have to be very very carefully and uh, maybe if the degree of misclassification of the expected misclassification is not very large maybe using quantitative bias analysis to kind of put bounds to where the bias can be but um, um, the first issue is data quality of course i didn't mention that but nothing works if the data quality is not good enough, and that applies to both randomized trials and op observational studies. The fact that we have a database that says treatment A and outcome Y doesn't mean that treatment A is good and outcome Y is good. In the old times, we used to do a lot of validation of the data, um, data coming from healthcare databases. That is not done as much now. Um, for multiple reasons. One is that there are privacy issues, uh, and, 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 and that's a pity because there are many analyses in which we never know how much we can trust the data. If possible, we always should provide evidence, again, through internal consistency checks or through comparisons with external data sources, uh, we should provide evidence that the data we're working good uh, with is good enough. Okay, one more question also from our remote audience. Can we use target trial emulation for observational studies of drugs for which there are no active comparators? So lack of equipoise. For example, drugs for orphan diseases where the trials are normally single arm with external control. Right, this is a very important question. Um, the answer in principle is yes, but in practice, what is going to happen when we compare drugs uh, with when 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 we do a head to head comparison, say of the of the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, we're not very concerned about confounding because the indications for one vaccine or the other are the same. The fact that you get one vaccine versus the other, it may be just that is the vaccine that was at the uh, at the health center where you went, but it's kind of random. Or if we make a comparison between two different studies, so two different cancer treatments that are given to the same type of patients, we're not very concerned about confounding. But if we compare a treatment versus no treatment, that is where the greatest potential for confounding is. Because if we compare, I mean, think of an extreme example. If we compare people who use antihypertensives and people who don't, well, those are completely different types of people in terms of their risk of heart disease. If we are trying to estimate the effect of antihypertensives on the risk of heart disease, we're going to have massive compounding there, right? Because the indications for antihypertensive use means that Essentially, everyone in that group has hypertension, whereas in the other group, not everyone has it. So there is not even overlap there. So when when we use uh, observational data to compare treatment, active treatment versus no treatment, the main concern is confounding. And we have to think very carefully about whether the indications for treatment may be indications for and maybe risk factors for the outcome. In the case that the that this person was asking, well, we are talking about orphan diseases, etc. It is possible that the indications for treatment have nothing to do with the particular outcome that we are looking at. And then 
uh, then we don't expect much compounding. But this has to be done on a case. What's supposed to happen in the area where we were supposed to meet? Well, I, I may show that here today. Uh, so, one of the key examples, just alluding to what you presented, fantastic side, is exactly what we did in relation to the vaccine. So one of the biggest observational study that we did and we published in, in Nature is comparing 2 million people who took the vaccine versus 1 million. Although there were trials happening in different places around the world, we wanted to do this in order to convince the public who are not, um, uh, who's not convinced in taking the vaccine or taking it. And it worked beautifully because you've got a, a great electronic record in hand uh, you have the access to all the data, you have the longitudinal access to all the data, and we're able to pull 1.8 million people who took the vaccine and two doses and follow them through, compared to the uh, almost 1.2 million that didn't take it. And I totally agree that this is the future. So, because in, in normal circumstances, you wouldn't be able to fund such a large study in a randomized controlled trial. You might have it in a lesser extent, and that wouldn't go far in most of the time, especially when you are talking rare, rare diseases. That means you have to take years and years and years to get people to enroll into the uh, study. Now, the question is, when we do observational, it's great, and you use it for publication peer review journals, but what would happen next? How can we get the FDA to accept this retrospective data to approve a drug for a certain use of medications? There is a lot of work being done at FDA and other regulators around the world about how to use this data. This is because there is, I think there is wide recognition that there is uh, value in in using observational data, real world data. Um, but the question is how to how to do it in the right way so that we don't um, we are protected against large biases. I think that um, using the data to explicitly emulate target trials goes a long way towards preventing many of the problems that we have seen in the past. Um, so that's probably a, one of, of the first things that that we should be doing. It's also we have to take into account also the considerations about confounding that I, I that I mentioned before. There will be cases in which confounding is intractable. The people who are treated and people who are not treated are so different that there is nothing we can do with some data sources. I gave you the example of. Um, screening colonoscopy versus not screening colonoscopy. There is nothing we can do to make uh, that using uh, insurance claims databases because, uh, and we did everything. You can think of, of the fanciest machine learning that you, we did it. It's impossible. There is not enough information in the data uh, to adjust for the differences between, between those two people. So I think a very important um, Something very important that we should be doing is research on what we cannot do with observational data. I gave you a lot of examples of what we can do. They all have something in common, is that either there is very little compounding or there, uh, there is a, a lot of compounding, but we know the compounders and we have measured them. And then it works well. But in many other cases, it's not going to be possible with some data sources to. To do that, and um, in in a sense, we should start building a catalog of things that we can and cannot do with observational data, and under which circumstances we should be very concerned. Uh, that's not happening as systematically as could be happening. And in fact, I have the experience in 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 some cases in which we have we have uh, after a lot of work we have concluded that it's impossible to estimate certain causal effect using certain database. And at that point, we try to publish it. And it's extremely hard to publish. And we make our case and say, look, 
all this work we have done, if it is published, would prevent others from doing it. Why, if this is not published, no one will know until they do it by themselves and spend four months that it's impossible to answer this question using this particular database. Editors are very reluctant to publish that type of, of things because from their point of view is, well, you did something, it's biased. You tell me, you are telling me this is biased and you want me to publish it? I say yes, precisely because it is biased, because we have done it correctly. And everyone is interested in this question. Many other groups are going to try to do it. Let's publish it so that other people know that it's not possible. Let's not waste more time doing this. And so there is, um, I think there is some process here that we as a, as a scientific community have to go through in which, in which we agree to somehow publish the failures as long as they are well documented and there are data failures, not analysis failures, which is what happens in many cases. So I have one last question and your comment is maybe a good lead into this question. So as a non-expert, I'd like to ask the question uh, whether the target trial emulation uh, per approach is now gaining adherence and it's like a wave or do you have to wait until the 70s uh, data <laughs> experts going to retirement until the, as you showed, arguably not just better, but the right way of doing this will be the standard practice and you wouldn't have to argue with editors anymore. I think I think that there I think that there is a movement towards a greater use of this target trial framework. It's now being used by the Cochrane Collaboration. Yeah, it's, it's being used by by the European um, Society of Cancer Trials when, when they don't have trials. Okay. It's, it's something that uh, has been um, has been published in several national academy reports. It's it's is gaining traction, but I think it's it's very easy for it to gain traction because because one is not completely new. It's really you think in terms of a target trial. Well, that is how how most people uh, think in terms of clinical research or public health research. They they know trials, so this allows them to link everything that they know about randomized trials with observational data. So it's a unifying framework. It also has an advantage, which is that even though here I was showing you only relatively simple questions of non-time varying treatments, but once we have time varying treatments, this way of thinking uh, can encompass all those cases too. And that on those and those are the cases where where we have to use more sophisticated methods for uh, for adjustment for time varying compounding, like the G formula or other forms of G methods by Robbins. So by thinking in terms of a target trial framework, we really have a, a coherent way of thinking about, about a study design across many different settings and to think about, have a systematic way of thinking of bias also and, and, a, and a principal way of asking cost cost questions. So it's really fulfilling a lot of missions at the same time. And I think I think that we will see more and more use of of this way of thinking. So there are actually many more questions from our online audience, which I will which I only take a few positive spin here, which is a strong indication of how well your presentation resonated with all of us here. And so I'd like to thank at this point one more time our colleagues from Khalifa University for hosting us and joining us for the seminar. And I also like to thank a number of the individuals from the uh, Dia Lab Operations Board who worked hard with the IT group and the IT department here at Khalifa University to make this all happen. And of course, finally, I'd like to thank our speaker, Miguel Hernan, for his excellent presentation to make us think different about how we look at observational data. Thank you.